Good morning. Good morning. All right. Let us kneel for word of prayer. Our gracious and eternal Heavenly Father, we thank you for your truth as it is in Christ Jesus. And the Sarada says, lift him up. And Father, as your children, we are truly to lift you up. And in speaking to Moses, uh, the instruction was given for him to lift, to have that serpent lifted high. And Father, may we see that when we look to Christ, who is that one lifted high, that we may have healing and that we may truly be brought uh, back into your fold to be delivered from sin. Be with us as we go through the study of your word and make clear to our mind through your Holy Spirit, your perfect and divine will, so that you may work out your perfection and character within us. These mercies we ask to your Son's wonderful name. Amen. 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 All right, good morning and a pleasant Sabbath to one and all. All right, we are continuing in the same theme. We would have, in successive weeks, week before we would have looked at 1 John 3 and 1 John 4 last week. And we're going to look at 1 John 5. And we're going to see what John is speaking of concerning the character of God and revealing this constant unfolding. And he's going deeper and deeper each time to show the perfect will of God concerning his character, what he wants to uh, show to us. Because remember, as Jesus says in John 5, 39, he says, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and there are they that testify of me. If you look in the scriptures and you cannot see Christ, you are not looking correctly. And we are to look at the scriptures and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, we are to see Christ in that. And I think it was said of Martin Luther that there were about four books that he did not find inspired. And I think he said Hebrews, James, Revelation, and another, I can't remember the name of the other book, but it is said that Martin Luther uh, did not think these books were inspired because he could not see Christ in it. And you have to understand where Martin Luther was because uh, light was, was now coming. Remember that Martin Luther is only 200 years after the herald of the Reformation in Wycliffe. So the light is still progressing and they're still in the, the, the Dark Ages period. But know that we are in this time, the Lord has definitely given us much light on Hebrews, James, and the Revelation. And we are seeing the wonderful character of God that is being brought up. Because whenever we study the Word of God, we have to see what it is saying concerning Christ. Because it is completely about who God is. And God has gone to great lengths to simply uh, make known to us who He is, knowing that it is imperative for us to know who He is if we are to have a relationship with Him. All right, so let's turn to First John chapter five. First John chapter five, and we're going to read the entire chapter. First John chapter five. All right, First John chapter five, verse one. I'll begin, and we'll read alternately. Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him that begat loveth him also that is begotten of him. And by this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Whosoever born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God? This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. 
and it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear record, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. If we receive the witness of men, and the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he have testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of the Son. And this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you uh, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hear of us. And we know that he hear and we know that he hear us for whatsoever we ask, and we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. If any man see his brother sin a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him for life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world life in wickedness. And, and we know that the Son of God is come, and have given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Verse 21, together. Little children, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Amen. So, John, in this chapter, verse 5, is continuing, is expounding on the character of God throughout this entire epistle. And in verse 1 he says, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loveth him, that begat, loveth him also, that is begotten of him. So we can only know that Jesus is the Christ. We can only know that he is God through the Holy Spirit. And quite often, Jesus, you remember what Jesus' re request was of the disciples? He asked them, or sorry, the question he asked them, he says, who do you say that I am? Because many people were saying that this is just the son of the carpenter, Joseph. But they were saying, no, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And they uh, believed firmly that this was God who had come manifest in the flesh. And why it is important to understand that is because since Christ is a God, is God, he is the one who is to give the clearest demonstration upon who he is, upon who God the Father is. And realize that when it is when Jesus gave this demonstration of God's character that he asks them if uh, asks who am I, who do you say that I am? It is not, he did not um, expect them just to uh, bring that submission for that admission for They had to see the character of God in Christ so that they can say, truly, this is God. And this is what he wanted them to be drawn to. Because remember, the expectation of the Jewish nation was to have a deliverer who would come and deliver them from the physical bondage of the, the Romans. And God was saying, that is not the type of government that I have come to set up. And I have not come to bring about death and bloodshed upon the Romans. I have come to deliver the entire world from sin. I have come to you, my people, to use you as my agents to bring uh, this truth about. And Jesus wanted them to say that this was the Son of God. And it's interesting that when uh, you have Philip, who says, um, show us the Father. And Jesus says, have I been so long time with you, Philip, 
and yet you're still asking me, me to show you the Father. And God wanted them, and Jesus' response was, that he that has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus was trying to bring out to them constantly the character that you're seeing displayed here is the character of God the Father, and it is the character that God wants you to have. Because there, remember that among the disciples was a clamoring for the number one position. I remember that even the mother of James and John came to Christ, uh, and she came to try to secure a spot, a number one spot for the son, her sons in the kingdom of Christ not understanding the type of government that he was to set up. Because if they understood the questions and the great controversy and what the controversy demanded, it demanded that the character of God be made plain through the Son of God. And this would not have been done if Christ had come to uh, set up the type of government that they, that they thought he was coming to set up. So what God was really coming to do was to come and to clear the misconceptions from our mind and give us a clear demonstration of who he is so that we can have his character. Verse 2 of 1 John 5. He says, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Now, the commandments have often been a great ridicule of many, especially those of our friends in the Sunday keeping world, and say that the law of God is abolished and that uh, those who are trying to keep it are actually in bondage, not understanding why the law of God has been given. Because remember, as we saw last week in Jeremiah 31, and verses 31 to 33, God wanted the law of God written in their hearts. He says, and speaking of the new covenant, he says, Behold, the day is come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write it in their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So the reason for placing the law of God in their hearts was that they can truly be the people of God, that they can have his character. And in Christ's Object Lessons, page 315, Sister White makes the following statement. She says, God requires perfection of his children. His law is a transcript of his own character, and it is the standard of all character. This infinite standard is presented to all that there may be no mistake in regard to the kind of people whom God will have to compose his kingdom. The life of Christ on earth was a perfect expression of God's law, and when those who claim to be children of God become Christ-like in character, they will be obedient to God's commandments. Then the Lord can trust them to be of the number who shall compose the family of heaven, clothed in the glorious apparel of Christ's righteousness. They have a place at the king's feast. They have a right to join the blood-washed throne. Brother Ben, uh, can we also equate the Lord to Christ? Because when you look at the great controversy, that the issue that all Satan had also with Christ, with the government of God, with the foundation of God, and for those people who argue that the law is abolished, when you get to the nitty gritty of it and you understand that the law is Christ, can you abolish Christ? Because to try to abolish the law is to abolish Christ, which is in effect to do the same thing that Satan tried to do in heaven. Well, yeah, and, and you can because remember it says. His law is a transcript of his character, and his character is who God is, because God is love. And you cannot abolish uh, the, you cannot abolish God, God who is eternal in love, 
which is the very law of God, which is love. So uh, for those who say that the law of God is abolished, they need to study better, the, especially the sanctuary. Because what the sanctuary shows, especially with the Ark of the Covenant, is that you have the very commandments itself inside the Ark with the covering cherubs, which is a representation of the throne of God, and God is revealing to us in that his character. And it's interesting because the, law, the sanctuary is to show the plan of salvation. So therefore, God is saying to us that for man to be saved, he must first receive a knowledge of who God is. Because unless there is a knowledge of who God is, there can be no salvation from sin. So, quoting the verse again, 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 34, Awake to righteousness and sin not, for some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. So, if we do not have a knowledge of who God is, we do not know his character, we cannot become perfect as she is, as he is, sorry. And I'm thinking of, I was about to quote Sister White. So, <laughs> God requires perfection of his children. His law is a transcript of his own character. So, since he requires perfection of his children, and now she's saying his law is a transcript of his own character, God wants us to look into that law and see who Christ is, to see who he is. And this is why Paul in Romans 7, and we can turn there for a little bit, Romans 7. Romans 7 and we can read from verse 1 to Verse 1 to 12. <clears throat> yes, verse 1 to 12. And if we read alternately, Romans 7, verses 1. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he liveth. For the woman is a husband. husband. He's bound by the law to her husband so long as he lives. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then, if while her husband liveth, she shall be married to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, so that she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. Therefore, my brethren, we also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that he should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh, and this is functionally, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead, wherein we were held, and that we should serve in the newness of spirit, and not in the wholeness of the letter. Verse 7. What shall we say then? Is the law of God sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But, but sin, sin taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me altogether. Therefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Now though we would have read verses 1 to 12, I want to focus in from verses 7 to 12. 7 to 12. Paul asks, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? And Paul's response is, God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law, for I had not known lust except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. And since the law of God is a transcript of his character, 
anything that is seen contrary to the character of God is sin. And that is what God is trying to show us. That anything that is contrary at all to the loving character of God is sin. So he says, the law of God then cannot be sin. He says, nay, I had not known sin but by the law. Because when we, do, when we see differently from what we see in Christ, we know that it is not in the way of life, but it's actually the way of death, and that it is a way of sin. He says, but sin taken occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. So this is parallel to Paul's statement in Romans 4 and verse 15, when he says, because the law worketh wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. And people argue that the word is so simple and bad. And then they will still argue that the law of God is abolished. So how, what type of world would you expect if the law of God is abolished in the earth? And when the knowledge of God, Paul, it's interesting how Paul continues on. Paul in Romans 1 actually shows the behavior of those who have not received the law of God in their hearts. And he says that they have been given over to a reprobate mind. In Romans 1, and I think verse, right, verse 28. He says, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And he continues in verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, cautiousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventor of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. So, as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, since the law of God is a transcript of his character, and you do away with the law of God, you are saying also that you do not want to retain God in your knowledge. And this is what has been they have been given up to, over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. And for us, who say that we still keep the law, if after we have seen the revelation of God's character in Christ, and we still continue on, in sin, we also are giving ourselves up to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. So we must retain the knowledge of God in our minds, the knowledge of his character, and allow that to transform us. So this is what is being brought up concerning the law of God, because unless there is a knowledge of who he is, the perfection of God cannot be accomplished in his people. So he says, verse 9 of Romans 7, back to Romans 7. He says, For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. So Paul is saying that I found life in the law of God, not death, not something that uh, generates that the law of God, there is life in that. And it is interesting where Peter's response, when Jesus asks the disciples in John 6, he says, will he also go away? And, Jesus, and Peter said, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of life. In the word of God and his law, there is life because God, as we saw, is life. And this is what is being brought up. 
So we cannot go to any other but to Christ. And if you get rid of the law of God, uh, then you're also putting away God who is like because the law of God is a transfer of his character and it cannot be blotted up. He says, for sin, verse 11, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. And he says, wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. So why, why would you want to get rid of something that is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good? As a matter of fact, the scriptures show that that which is holy and just and good cannot be gotten rid of, and because it abideth forever. Because remember in Acts, and the Apostle Peter is preaching, Acts 2, and speaking of Christ, in verse 24 of Acts 2, the Apostle Peter says the following, Acts 2, and starting at verse 23. 22, sorry. He says, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and wicked hands, have crucified and slain whom God have raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. So Christ, who was the law, as Brother Wayne uh, has equated, he lived out that law perfectly. And remember he said in Matthew 5, he says that he was to come to fulfill the law of God. He lived out the law of God perfectly, because up until this point, the law of God was requiring perfect obedience. And there was none that have rendered perfect obedience to what the law required but Christ. And since he rendered perfect obedience, Paul says, sorry, Peter says, that he could not, Christ could not be holden uh, of death because that was not for him because he lived a perfect life. Now it is interesting, as Peter is outlining, that the same Jews who were keeping the law of God and I put in inverted commas, who were keeping the law of God were the same ones who took the Son of God, and he says, by wicked hands have crucified and slain Christ. So what does it mean then to truly keep the law of God? Because Christ came to be the perfect expression of the law of God, and they thought quite the opposite. They thought that he was a rebel and an upstart and all these things, and they did not see that in him was the perfect revelation of the law of God, a perfect transcript of God's character. And it was that that was to transform them. And Jesus, in speaking about Abraham, he says, Abraham saw my day and was glad. What Christ saw concerning Abraham, sorry, what Abraham saw concerning Christ, uh, at that point where he was called to sacrifice Isaac, he saw the, the character of God in such a way as he had never seen before. And what God is constantly doing with us through his word and through our daily experiences, experiences are, is revealing himself. And he wants to so perfectly reveal himself that in every moment, at every situation, we can trust him so that by the time of the crisis, that the people of God will so trust him, regardless of how things uh, may appear. Because remember, Sister White says that we're going to be the objects of universal execration. That the people of God are going to be seen as, and hear the expression, the scum of the earth. They, they're going to be the ones who, that the world is saying, you are the ones, you are the one who is responsible for everything that is going on. And the people of God will be trusting him in spite of all that is going on. And in our Mesonite studies, we have been saying that unless we have a knowledge of who God is, that when certain things come upon the believer, the perfect rest that is supposed to abide uh, cannot be theirs. It cannot be ours if we think that God is one who 
um, a low suffering just because these are things that he likes to see. But no, the suffering is for what? For our sanctification, for our cleansing. And that is what the suffering, the tests, and the trials are for to work out in us the same perfect character of Christ. But we are to be uh, trusting in his word, allowing that word to perfect us. If we do not allow it to perfect us and make us like him, it is really of no effect to us as it was to the Jews. Because as they were reading the oracles, studying the word of God, they did not allow what was seen in the Old Testament to transform them. And people may think that the concept of being born again is a new concept. It is not a new concept. And this was made evident in John 3 when Christ is speaking to Nicodemus. Because remember what Jesus told him, you must be born again. And Nicodemus said, you're telling me that I have to go back in my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus' response was, though a leader in Israel, I know it's not these things. So since Jesus res responded to him in such a manner, it means that the new birth is not was not at all a new concept in Israel. Because as we read before in Jeremiah 31, God was showing that I would place the law of God in your inner parts, in your heart. And I will place, and he says, you will be my people, and you shall be, and I will be your God. And we can only be God's people if we represent him in character. And I and I think it is probably the reason for certain countries that uh, you cannot be the prime minister or the president of a certain country unless you have been born there yourself. Because how can you understand and be at one with them if you are born somewhere else and have had another culture and have experienced that culture? And you have to have fully been raised in that culture and be one with the people. And God is saying, in the same way, I want to be one with you and have my character to be yours. Because remember, when God created man, he created him in what? In the image of God. So they, were, they reflected him. God didn't say, well, I'm going to create, even though in regards to the rest of his creation, that humanity was a complete the uh, distinct order, God still created us in his image. And that is what his, his perfect will is to have us represent him in character. So the law, going back to Romans 7, is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. And Paul, I believe, would have been quoting from Psalm 19 where uh, the psalmist says that the law of God is perfect, converting the soul, converting the sinner. So therefore, what about the law of God uh, really transforms the sinner? I, I, are you telling me that simply looking at the Ten Commandments, reading 1 to 10, or now that I read it, it is that is going to transform me? No. What the psalmist was talking about was a revelation of the character of God, because that is the only thing that can change the believer. So, and I just want to look at Galatians 3 for a minute, where Paul speaks concerning the law. Galatians 3 and verse 19. And Paul speaking about the law being added. And this is this is a very uh, controversial chapter, and it should not be. But Galatians 3, and verse 19, Paul says, Wherefore then serveth the law? It was added because of transgression to the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. And going on further, Paul says, Wherefore the law was our schoolmaster, verse 24, to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. Now, people read this chapter and see this and say, well, 
which law is it that Paul is talking about? And some people say that it is the moral law. Some people say it is a ceremonial. But remember, Jesus says in John 5, 39, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and there are they that testify of me. The entire word of God is to speak of Christ. And Sister White, in regards to this statement, she says that the law that Paul is speaking about in Galatians 3 is both the moral and the ceremonial. And I just want to read it from you from um, SDA Bible Commentary, because what was given in the types was also to draw them to Christ, as Paul lines in Colossians 2. Galatians 3, uh, SDA Bible Commentary. SDA Bible Commentary, and I think it is volume 6, and I think she comments on, yes. So, Bible Commentary, volume 6, and this is page 1109, uh, and continuing on 1109, Bible Commentary, volume 6. She says, the law points to Christ. The law has no power to pardon the transgression, but it points him to, to Christ Jesus, who says to him, I will take your sin and bear it myself. If you will accept me as your substitute and surety, return to your allegiance, and I will impute you to my righteousness. And this is a, would have been a compilation, so they're quoting from Review and Herald, May 7th, 1901. So she says that the law has no power to pardon transgressor, but it points him to Christ Jesus so that when he is pointed to Christ, he can accept Christ as his substitute and surety and to be the one to be the deliverer from sin. And this is how the law of God works to convert the sinner and to make him perfect in Christ. She continues. She says, which law is the schoolmaster? She says, I am asked concerning the law in Galatians. So it wasn't a it wasn't a controversy only today, it was in her day too. She says, What law is the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ? She says, I answer both the ceremonial and the moral code of Ten Commandments. Christ was the foundation of the whole Jewish economy. The death of Abel was in consequence of Cain's refusing to accept God's plan in the school of obedience to be saved by the blood of Jesus Christ typified by the sacrificial offerings, doing what? Pointing to Christ. Cain refused the shedding of blood, which symbolized the blood of Christ to be shed for the world. This whole ceremony was prepared by God, and Christ became the foundation of the whole system. This is the beginning of its work as a schoolmaster to bring sinful human agents to a consideration of Christ. All who did service in connection with the sanctuary were being educated constantly in regard to the intervention of Christ in behalf of the human race. This service was designed to create in every heart a love for the law of God, which is the law of his kingdom. The sacrificial offering was to be an object lesson of the love of God revealed in Christ in the suffering dying victim who took upon himself the sin of which was guilt, of which man was guilty, the innocent being made sin for us. Now I find that now for a person reading this the first time it may seem confusing. It says the sacrificial offering was to be an object lesson of the love of God revealed in Christ in the suffering dying victim who took upon himself the sin of which man was guilty, the innocent being made sin for us. So how could such a system where you had this bloodshed of this animal be a representation of the love of God? Because you have, uh, and sadly enough, and you understand their ignorance, but you, you have atheists out there that say, well, it seems that God uh, loves bloodshed and he, he always wants these things to appease him or whatever it is. But no, what was being revealed was the love of God because Christ 
the innocent one would come and die for man, and he would not only die for man, but become sin, so that we may be made what? The righteousness of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 21. So this is what the sacrificial offering served to point us to Christ, to point us to the love of God, to see the beautiful character of God as revealed even in those times. Any question? All right, continuing. She says, in the contemplation of this great theme of salvation, we see Christ's work. Not only the promised gift of the, of the Spirit, but also the nature and character of this sacrifice and intervention is a subject which should create in our hearts elevated, in our hearts elevated, sacred high ideas of the law of God, which holds its claims upon every human agency. The violation of the law in the small act of eating of the forbidden fruit brought upon man upon the earth and upon the earth the consequence of disobedience to the holy law of God. The nature of the intervention should ever make man afraid to do the smallest action in disobedience to God's requirement. There should be a clear understanding of which constitutes sin, and we should avoid the least approach to step over the boundaries from obedience to disobedience. So in the sanctuary, God was also showing to us what sin is and the consequences of sin, and he was also showing to us his character. So in it, God was really bringing to view in the sanctuary types, in the sanctuary services, the controversy showing for man to make his choice between the government of sin or the government of righteousness. And this is what he was showing to us in the text. But, and it is interesting that we will read these things, think it is boring, and you wonder where all this going on, but God is actually revealing even the entire great controversy and the plan of salvation, even in the sacrificial services. And this is why Sister White says, unless we understand the sanctuary service, she says we cannot serve the Lord in the capacity that we should at this time. The people of God must have a perfect understanding of the sanctuary service and its role and what it serves to bring man to Christ. She says, God would have every member of his creation understand the great work of the infinite Son of God in giving his life for the salvation of the world. Behold what manner of love the Father have bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. When he sees in Christ the embodiment of infinite and disinterested love and benevolence, there is awakened in the heart of the sinner a thankful disposition to follow where Christ is joined. And this is taken from manuscript 87, and this is the year 1900. So what is seen in the law of God is the embodiment, and not only in the law, but in the types and the services, the embodiment of infinite and disinterested love and benevolence. There is awakened in the heart of the sinner a thankful disposition to follow where Christ is drawn. And it is interesting that we can look into the law of God, look into these types and these services, and still have a picture of a selfish God and one who has uh, a love that is divided. You know, God has infinite and a disinterested love and benevolence towards all of his creation, not just towards those who have the Spirit of God. He wants for all men to receive the Spirit of God, to come to a knowledge of who he is and receive salvation. And this is what God's people have to see at this time. So this is why Paul, in Galatians 3, he says, Wherefore then serves the law? It was added because of transgressions. And since it was added because of transgression, transgression had come in, and it was added to keep man from bondage. Because sin came in, and it brings man into bondage. There is no liberty at all in sin. And Satan's attempt was to make us think that there is liberty in sin. 
and he would, he would have gotten our first parents by showing them, listen, I have eaten of this fruit and I have, I have the ability to speak and all these things and I have become like a God basically. And I have chosen my way and I'm still alive. And when it comes to, he says, oh my God, God is, is just as selfish as he's trying to avoid you from becoming. And don't, don't listen to him. Just eat the food. You're not going to die. And Satan is saying that that is what he was trying to convey, that I have chosen the way of selfishness, and I am still in life. And he says, don't mind God in choosing this thing of self-sacrifice and putting away no. And God wants us to see what the truth is concerning his character, and this is what the entire word of God serves for. It serves to bring man to an accurate knowledge of who God is, from Genesis right down to Revelation. So we may go through the entire word of God and think that certain parts are boring and that they mean nothing. And I think a word, even when he was going through the genealogies uh, some couple months back, that growing up you thought that the genealogies were boring and there were things that you typically skipped over. And sometimes I would consider that I would read it and skip over the genealogy, I would read Matthew 1 and then skip over. And you no, know, the entire word of God is showing to us something about the character of God, about who he is. Because God wants us to be very clear and very certain on who he is. All right, so back to 1 John, and we're going to wrap up. 1 John 5. First John 5, and he says, Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is a victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And it is whatsoever is born of God that overcomes the world. And Jesus, in John 16, 33, says, that he has overcome the world. And those who are putting their trust in Christ will have that faith to overcome. So he says it is, it is that which is born of God, the faith which is born only of Christ, which Christ is both the author and finisher of. It is only that that will overcome the world. Verse 5, who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ, not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that bear witness, because the Spirit is true. Now, verses 6 and 7 are typically are controversial verses as well, because there have been views that verse 6 and 7, and possibly even 8, have been... Uh, Roman Catholic influence upon the interpretation. So it reads, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Now John is bringing out the Godhead here, and he's showing that God, the Father, God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they're all one in character. And this is what needs to be seen. And I am not too sure when the controversy over these verses would have uh, surfaced. But what is to be seen is that what was seen in Christ, remember that Jesus in John 10, 30 says, I am my Father, or what? Or one. So God wants to see that the Godhead, who is uh, the Father and the Son, with the union through the Holy Spirit, are perfect in one. So continuing on to verse 9. He says, If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. So God is, has testified of who he is through who? Through Christ. And this is bringing us back to Hebrews 1 and verse 3. He's at, well, verse 1 to 3, where he said, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke unto us in times past to the prophets, but now in these last days has spoken unto us through his Son. 
And God is so amazing. And Christ had to, to come to give that clearest revelation. And it is interesting when you read the Old Testament and you see the experiences of Elijah and of Job and of Abraham and of Moses, the perfection of character to which they attained, they would have seen the love and the character of God in such a way that it was enough to keep them from sin. So though the clearest demonstration of God's character is given in Christ, and Paul brings this out in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6. He says that the light on the knowledge of God was seen in the face of Jesus Christ. He says, verse 6 of 2 Corinthians 4, he says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So Christ was manifested for that reason. Now remember in 1 John 3, it says that Christ was manifested to do what? To destroy what? The works of the devil. So what were the works of the devil? And I'm asking a question, what were the works of the devil? Remember the works of the devil are what? The works of the devil are the lies that were told concerning God's character. So that was Jesus manifested to bring the truth on who God is. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And it was for this reason that Jesus was manifested to make clear to all the inhabitants, not only of this earth, but the entire universe on who God is. So that is what it was for. So Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, and he didn't do it by coming and destroying Satan because he would think that that is how it, it should have been done. And that is how man would think. To destroy uh, the works of a person, you would think to try to destroy them as well. But no, God did it by the demonstration of what? Of infinite love. Because remember, desire of ages, Sister White says that love is the prevailing power in God's government. And it is the only weapon that he has against him. He cannot use anything else. Force, nothing of that nature which is of sin, God cannot use to win a great controversy. God can only use love to win a great controversy. And therefore, therefore, hold on, therefore, when he won the great controversy initially through Christ, he won it only through a demonstration of his infinite love in Christ. And therefore, for it to be fully finished in these last days, it, the love of God must be fully reflected in who? In his people, in us, so that this work can be finished. So the ones who are delaying the great controversy coming to an end is us. And because we're not allowing the word of God, what is revealed in the law, in the types of concerning Christ, to transform us and change us. Because that is what, that is what the word of God serves, to change us and make us into the image of Christ. Brother John. Um, yeah, what what we are encountering today, especially in this world of sin, and this is why the people of God will shine so brightly, because they will not uh, allow these circumstances to change and to bring them out of submission to the love of God. Because remember Romans 8 and verse 35. Paul says, verse 35 of Romans 8. He says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, 
no angels, no principalities, no powers, no things present, no things to come, no height, no death, no any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So Paul would have seen in Christ the love of God to such an extent that it would have transformed him and kept him so that even in this time of earth's history, where the darkness is definitely great, that it is that love that will keep that will first transform God's people and will keep them uh, from being engulfed in that same darkness. So even in that light, in light of what is going on, especially uh, these days and obviously very recently, it is to be we are to be allowing what we see in His Word concerning the character of God to be daily transforming us, and that the people of God are to be moving upward and forward, so that, um, remember with Moses, when he would have finished coming down from the mount, uh, the light of God shone out in him so much that the people were, and it shows the condition that they were in. The people were like, whoa, Moses, this light is, is blinding to us. And Moses, in mercy, took a veil and covered his face so that because that the light of God's character of his love was shining up through Moses and you can understand why God was I don't want to say offended but why it was that's a very offensive to God oh no it was a really offensive to God that Moses would have had such an experience with the Lord and then to fall back for what he did to smite the rock and people are, are saying that God is so merciful, but then when he came and dealt with Moses, God is so harsh. And it, it seems as though, and besides any other person than Christ, and this is why Moses is also a type of Christ, that God deal with in such a harsh way. He, Moses, I think it was three times, asked the Lord concerning it. And God told Moses, speak to me no more of the matter. And he had to die and uh, was later resurrected. So it was really, it was really offensive to God that Moses would have given such a demonstration, not of God's character, but of the character of the enemy. The word harsh might not be the best word to use there. Just. 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 Okay. All right. So. God dealt with him justly, and it may seem, and let me say what I, it may seem that God is dealing harshly with Moses, but he's dealing with him in the right way. Uh, because with Christ also, remember that if Christ has sinned, how many times? Once. The plan of salvation will have been out to sea, and we will be lost. And this is why Moses was also seen as a type of Christ, because God dealt with him thus. And so is God, especially at this time. When we are truly walking with Christ as we are, that God should be able to deal with us in the same way. And it is not to frighten us. We should so know and so love the Lord that it is our desire to walk in his ways and not see it as grievous as uh, John says. He says, in verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not Jesus. The love of God when it is in our hearts and we are constantly abiding in Christ we will not see it as grievous but see it as our highest joy to be before the Lord to praise him. And remember a couple uh, Sabbaths back we were looking in our high calling, I think it was page 96 where she is speaking about uh, waking up in the morning and going to bed at night. She says that our first stop in the morning should be of Christ, and our last stop before we go to bed should be of Christ. And it is to keep our minds constantly on Christ. Anytime that our focus is lost and it is taken off of Christ, there is always <coughs> failure and defeat. And we always wonder why we end back up in the same place. Because Christ, the eye was taken off of Christ. And we must keep our eyes upon Christ, who is the uh, 
exact transcript of that law revealing his character completely. And when we have that law of God fully represented in us, uh, truly God can say that we are his people and that he is our God. So he says, and this is a record that God has given to us eternal life, verse 11, and this life is in his Son. So God has given us eternal life, and the life is where? In his Son. So how can this eternal life be in Christ if, as some of our friends said, that Christ was created? The, this eternal life, which is no beginning, no end, is in Christ. For in Christ dwelleth the what? The whole Godhead bodily. So Christ has given Christ is the only one who can give us eternal life because he is God. And it's not that he's any lesser God, he is God, Yahweh, Jehovah. And that is who Christ is. And this is eternal life, and this life is in his son. So the representation of the character of God as seen in the life of Christ is what is to give the people of God eternal life. Because Jesus says in John 73, and this is eternal life that they may do what? They may know thee, Jesus Christ, that they may know thee, I me, mean, I always misquote. John 17, 3. And this is like eternal no, that they may know the God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So this is what the revelation of God was for, to give us life eternal. Because God wants us to know very clearly who he is if we must experience salvation. I'm going to start at verse 12 and then we'll close. And he he that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So what was seen in Christ was the perfect representation of the character of God. And those who have Christ also have that same perfect life of God abiding in them. And he says that those who do not have the Son hath not life. When we have not truly received the law of God, which is a transfer of his character, into our life, we do not have life. We must receive Christ, who is that perfect representation. And this is what John is bringing out in these chapters of 1 John, in, these, in this epistle, to show who God really is. Because unless we have a knowledge of who God is, we cannot truly have a relationship with him. And this is why God would have brought Moses up into the mount to dwell with him, not once, but twice for 40 days. And and I'm not playing on words, but when you look even on with Elijah and Job, the words that are said that God, remember, sorry, not Elijah, Enoch, it says that God walked, that Job walked with the Lord, and he was not. And Job did not walk with an in-between. God, Job walked with Christ, and as Job walked verily with him, hand in hand, and beheld Christ face to face. And the same thing, speaking of Moses, God said that I have not had such a prophet like Moses, who spoke to him what? Face, face to face. And God has, when you go through the history of these uh, prophets and of these patriarchs, you see that God was really uh, speaking to them face to face, had that deep relationship with them. There was no in between. Now we're seeing that Christ is an intercessor for us. But remember that at the end of it all, the people of God are to stand before him without what? A mediator. They're just supposed to stand without a mediator. And remember Christ, that role of mediator will cease. Because now the people of God will see him face to face. Where now that face to face experience, is it supposed to occur then or now? No, we can have that face-to-face -face experience with God right now because they, the people of, of Israel, when speaking to Moses, they said, you speak to God because you seem to know him and they were afraid of him. And God did not want them at all to be afraid of him. Remember, perfect love casts all fear. 
And God wants to make us perfect in love so that we can always be bold and confident before him. And it is not that we are going to be disrespectful in his presence. No. But we must have a boldness and a joy in being in his presence, having that face-to-face and comfortability. Uh, so, uh, uh, the scripture says that God showed to Moses his hinder parts, his back parts. And in regards to seeing God fully, no, Moses did not see him fully. But God would have, remember, the scripture says that God came to show him his hinder parts. So if God, I don't believe that God has any uh, backward parts, the expression is given in that way. But it is God given to Moses uh, so much of that revelation of who he is so that he can bear and he be not consumed. And God wants to bring us up to that experience where we can stand before him without have without the necessity of an in-between, a mediator, where we can have that face-to-face experience with him. But we can only have that if we are allowing the word of God to cleanse us and make us pure as he is pure. Because remember, even when Christ was here and he had the our flesh and our nature upon him, even those who had the same flesh and the same nature of Christ still felt condemned in his presence. So it means, therefore, that God needs to do a work in our minds to transform us and to make us like him. Because remember, flesh and blood will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. It will not inherit the kingdom of God. And God has to transform us in character to fit us. And then when we are transforming character, God can give us a body to suit. All right, so remember that what the entire word of God is for is not just for us to just browse through it and say that that is nice and I like that. No, the entire word of God is a revelation of who God is. And the rev- this revelation, and I'll read it again from Manuscript 87, the year 1900. She says, when the believer, when he sees in Christ the embodiment of infinite and disinterested love and benevolence, there is awakened in the heart of the sinner a thankful disposition to follow where Christ is drawn. And it is this embodiment of the infinite and disinterested love of God that is to transform us in character. And that is what the Word of God serves. It is to serve for the transformation of character to bring back, bring man back to the image of God, bearing the image of God. And that is the purpose. And that is what would have kept Adam and Eve at first. They, you remember Adam and Eve joy in God's presence. They weren't afraid of him. It was only when they transgressed and would have now been told by the enemy that God is not who you think he is. Because remember, he told Adam and Eve that in the day that you eat there, you will not die. So they're, they're saying, Satan was saying to them, when you eat, if you don't die, he said, if you do die, it's because not because of your transgression, but because somebody has killed you. And the only other person that he can be speaking of is God. So he's saying that if you die, it's because God has killed you. So God wants us to have this true knowledge of his character, that he is not the one, as the White says, who stands against the sinner as an executioner, but rather stands in mercy to bring the believer back to Christ to bear the image of God and not to have sin in him which separates man from life, separates man from God, and death, eternal death, is inevitable result. So it's the infinite, disinterested love of God that is constantly reaching out to us through his word to draw us back to him so that we can have his life. And I pray that we see that in our daily study of the word and not just have it as a routine but realize that it is the very character of God that is being revealed to us daily. All right? So we're going to close at this time. If there are no questions or comments, you need a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our 
Our gracious and eternal Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your loving mercy. We thank you for your truth as it is in Christ Jesus. And we thank you that your entire word shows completely who you are. There is nothing at all hidden in your word. And Father, it is beautiful that you are completely honest with us. And that even in the showing of the failure of your professed people, you constantly show those who have been redeemed, brought back, and who have borne the image of the heavenly. And Father, we also would have had similar experiences to these men who would have fallen and gone back up. And Father, we pray now that the revelation of your character uh, to us at this time is, has so abounded that it will keep us from sin, that it will truly awaken us to righteousness, and that our eyes are constantly kept in Christ, on, on Christ. So be with us throughout the remainder of the Sabbath. May the Holy Spirit keep our minds uh, in check and in submission to you and to your love. Father, these and all the mercies we ask through your Son's wonderful name. Amen. 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 All right, at this time, uh, we'll take a 10 minute break and we can use this time to use the facilities. And we'll also have. Uh, some service in the meeting.